it's, I'd like to introduce you now to uh, Dr. Well, you all have heard of uh, Dr. Imo Varntias, uh, who is a, uh, did his undergraduate degree in Göttingen, uh, postgraduate in Galway, and is now a lecturer in medieval Irish history in Queen's University, Belfast. And he's written extensively on the computers uh, in early medieval Ireland uh, a few years ago. 2010, we published a, uh, an enormous volume on an edition of the Munich uh, Computers, so called because it's now the Munich Library. Um, and uh, he's also uh, uh, with uh, Jacobo Rizang, a very interesting uh, article published in Aries some years ago of a newly discovered uh, computers in a library in Einsiedeln in uh, Switzerland with uh, Old Irish, in it, which is previously uh, 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 not being uh, you know, the first discovery of this uh, very important uh, document. Um, and he's going to talk to us today about uh, mathematics versus astronomy in early medieval art. Thank you very much, Liam. Can everybody hear me? Does the microphone work? Very good, perfect. Yeah. Um, it's a difficult task to bridge the gap between Celtic studies and physics uh, because uh, both ends will be disappointed, I suppose. Uh, I try to keep it as, as broad as possible. Uh, the idea for tonight, I suppose, is to get you a sense of how a 7th century scientist would have thought about um, astronomy, mathematics, but also, and uh, more importantly, um, to, for you to get a sense of our methodology and pr probably what I, what, what I like to illustrate uh, uh, on top of that is principally the progress that has been made in the field. Uh, Liam has mentioned that already, the progress that has been made in the field over the past 20 to 30 years. So you, you should get some good background on the kind of thought world of a scientist in the Latin West at around uh, 700. Uh, but also how we try to reconstruct this thought world uh, and the progress that has been made in that field over the past probably 30 years. Uh, a lot has been uh, done uh, over the past 30 years, as you will see. First, we need to uh, define the subject matter, which is uh, not necessarily straightforward, especially if you think about science, mathematics, physics from uh, um, the modern perspective through modern lenses. That does not necessarily work for the early medieval period. Um, basic question. What is early medieval Western science, which uh, the Western is very important uh, because that is different to Arabic science, uh, which is rising at the time, uh, plus obviously Greek science, um, where uh, more texts were available to scholars. So what we are dealing with here, and this is the fascination of the period, I will come back to that for us, is what do you do, how do you reconstruct science without having any basis? Uh, we'll come back to that. Um, Simply, to, to, to put that simply, with the fall of the Western Roman Empire, secular institutions were replaced by the rapidly developing monasteries uh, as the centers of learning. That is straightforward, which means learning became decidedly Christian in character. You learn, you acquire knowledge with uh, a Christian agenda. Uh, how does that work? Uh, that leads to basically two major subjects, or you're interested in, in two major aspects. Um, your main agenda is you want to understand God's creation. To understand God's creation, you can do two things. One is you can read the Bible. Second thing is you, you just look at the world that God created. So you try to understand the Bible, which, which is biblical exegesis, and you try to understand what you see in this world, including the heavenly bodies. This is where astronomy comes in. But you do that principally um, for, from the Christian perspective. The key thing you need to have first though is um, you need to know the language in which the books are written. Especially in Ireland, which was never part of the Roman Empire, you, you have to learn the language from scratch as a second language and that is Latin. So the first subject would be grammar, Latin grammar that is. Um, with Latin grammar then you are able to read the Bible um, that leads to exegesis, which is the interpretation of the Bible, and then you're still left with the cosmos uh, and with the, to explain the cosmos, and this is a science that we term computers. Um, that has two principal, um, two principal foci. One is understanding the cosmos. The other, most importantly for every cleric in every monastery, is to be able to date Easter. 
Easter is uh, not set. There was discussion in the third century to set it on the 25th of March. Um, had that been accepted, then this whole science would not necessarily have evolved. Um, Easter can fluctuate depending on which um, Easter reckoning you are following between 29 and 35 days. Today it's 35 days uh, between the 21st of March and the uh, 20. 22nd of March and the 25th of April um, and the whole liturgical calendar is based on that feast. That's why you need to calculate it in advance so that you can start the 40 day Lenten period uh, early enough otherwise um, you could easily just calculate it on the spot as, as we will see from observation. Um, this is all science. The Latin West is principally interested in, under in uh, understanding the cosmos and in having mathematical models to calculate Easter. You will find in the literature um, references to the Artes Liberalis. The Artes Liberalis in the period, say, 500 to 800, um, had no major impact. They were a theoretical model of how ideally to teach, but since there were no texts for it, you couldn't teach it. It's like me uh, writing an article in the Irish Times tomorrow saying Old Irish should be taught in every primary school. That does not mean that uh, next year Old Irish will be taught in every primary school. So if we read these texts, they are theoretical models, but they are not necessarily, it's not necessarily what you were taught uh, in the monasteries. Um, the centerpiece of computers, therefore, is the calculation of Easter. What does that mean? Easter then, as well as uh, today, Easter falls on the first Sunday after the first full moon, after the spring equinox. That means you have three components. One is the seven-day week uh, cycle. Uh, the second one is the lunar cycle, um, or more uh, precisely, the, the zenotic lunar month, the period from new moon to new moon. And the last one is the uh, solar calendar to define where the spring equinox is. These are the three components you have to bring together. Um, that caused this problem that you need to mathematically model astronomical phenomena like the course of the sun through the zodiac uh, plus also the moon phases. Um, that is the zenotic lunar month, the period from new moon to new moon. In order to know when the full moon is, you could potentially just wait till you see the full moon in the sky and then say the next Sunday we celebrate Easter. Problem is because the Lenten period starts 40 days earlier, you need to know that in advance. And if you then want to assert authority from further abroad, like Rome, for example, then you have to send out Easter letters at least a year in advance. And ideally, you come up with an Easter cycle that everybody adheres to, and then you have no problem whatsoever. So that, that is the key question for most of uh, the scientists at the time. Um, how do you mathematically model that? And uh, I won't go into too many technical details, uh, but this is just the basic theory, just for you to get a sense of what the problem is in creating a lunar calendar. Uh, the solar year has 365.2422. That is already an approximation, as you know. Um, but uh, the Julian calendar, unfortunately, only works with 365.25. This is why we need the Gregorian, or we needed the Gregorian calendar reform in the 16th century because the, um, the value they work with was a good approximation, but not obviously good enough uh, in, over the course of a few centuries. The synodic lunar month now is 29.5306 days. And that was always considered as only 29.5. Um, this is what they would have calculated with. So if you just divide, if you want to uh, combine to create a lunar calendar, you need to combine the synodic lunar month. It's simply the time it takes from one new moon to the next, or from one full moon to the next. That's it. That's 29.5306 days. If you just divide the solar year through the synodic lunar month, what you get is one solar year has 12 lunar months and an excess. So you can squeeze in 12 lunar months into the solar calendar and you have an excess of 0.3683. Um, this excess basically means it's um, in the course of three years, you roughly get one and full lunar month through this excess. 
So every three years, you'll have to intercalate, as we would say, add an extra lunar month. You'll have 12 months per year. Every th um, three years, you'll have 30 months. So 12 months every year, 13 every third year. Um, that, again, is now an approximation. Um, the approximations that were made at the time, then, uh, that is late antiquity. Keep in mind that these kind of calculations um, you could do still in late antiquity because you had the textual basis for it. Um, in the early Middle Ages, that became uh, far more difficult. An approximation of basically this number here, 0 0.3683, um, 3 divided by 8 would get extremely close to that. It's 0 0.375. 3 divided by 8 basically means you intercalate you have three extra months per eight years. It's a close approximation, but it's not close enough. That already after a few years, after a few cycles of eight years, uh, it will get ex exceedingly inaccurate. Um, the best approximation, and this is the approximation that people in the um, Middle Ages, throughout the entire Middle Ages worked from, is you intercalate seven lunar months, extra lunar months, in 19 years. That is the so-called 19-year cycle. Um, the Irish, in the early period, right until the early 8th century, worked from an 84-year cycle, um, where you intercalate 31 extra lunar months. That is just the basic theory. You don't need to, to understand necessarily more than that. The 84-year period has um, the great advantage that, as you all know, the weekday cycle is important. The weekday cycle is Seven, a week has seven days, but because of the b style or leap year every four years, your weekday um, cycle is 28 years. Now, 84 can be divided by 20, uh, 28. So this is a full Easter cycle. Uh, this makes the 84-year cycle much more interesting for people to calculate Easter than the 19-year cycle because uh, you can't divide uh, 19 through 28. Obviously, you'll need... Um, the Easter cycle there is 19 times 28 years, that's 532 years. Uh, that people thought uh, is not necessarily ideal because they never thought longer than one generation or uh, a lifetime. So these are the two different lunar cycles that we encounter in the early Middle Ages. What does that mean? Uh, don't get too confused or overwhelmed by the numbers. Uh, basically, the periods of lunar calendars are either 8, 14, or 19, um, eight, um, 84 or 19, and the 84 is the one used by the Celtic Irish Church in the early Middle Ages. The 19-year one is then the one uh, employed by Rome. Uh, just to oversimplify, as Beat uh, does himself, uh, it's more complex than that, but uh, you'll, you'll get uh, the background to that. This basically means, and this is what makes the early medieval period interesting and challenging for the scientists, you had three rivaling Easter tables followed in different parts of Europe at different times. I will give you a chart in, in a second just for you to see where it's solved. Just for you to appreciate roughly when these Easter tables were created. They are all created more or less in the 5th century. Uh, we still need somebody to work on um, the scientists uh, working in the first half of the 5th century, principally in gold. Most of them came from Aquitaine, which is quite interesting. So you have Victorius of Aquitaine who worked in Aquitaine, Sulpicius Severus who worked in Aquitaine. Mathematic, mathematical uh, knowledge uh, and expertise clustered in Aquitaine in the Latin West. Not necessarily Rome. Uh, and we need to work on why that is. One of our best chroniclers of the time, Prosper, uh, is called Prosper of Aquitaine. So there's something major going on there. Keep in mind this knowledge of creating an Easter table is then lost. After the 5th century, nobody can do that anymore. Somebody like Beach, who's always uh, lauded for his uh, scientific expertise, he would not have the expertise to create an Easter table. Um, this is roughly how it looks like in a chart, just to, to simplify it. Um, all I want to demonstrate with that, or, or illustrate with that, is that up to the 8th century, you have three rivaling Easter tables. Just to oversimplify that, just for you to get a good background, by Charlemagne's time, roughly at around 800, the problem is solved. Up to 800, you'll have major discussions about which of these three different reckonings is the most accurate one, the most theologically accurate, but also the most scientifically accurate, and the most practical. Those would be the, the considerations 
Um, by the, by uh, roughly around 800, that problem is solved. And then throughout the entire Middle Ages, you only have one Easter egg clean. You don't have that problem anymore. It only changes with the Gregorian calendar reform, and it still is a problem, obviously, for the church to the present day, because the Orthodox Church is still following what you see in red here, which was introduced in the, red, uh, in the Latin West in the 6th century. This is what uh, Orthodox Christians are still following today. Um, they would still also, obviously, for church matters, uh, follow the Julian rather than the Gregorian calendar. That's by Easter. Uh, that's by Christmas, even in the Orthodox churches, is celebrated on a different day. Just keep in mind that discussion about that ceases at around 800. This, the only area in Western Europe, as far as we know, where all three reckonings were followed at the same time. The only region is Ireland. And that is in the 7th century, the famous Easter controversy in the 7th century, going all the way into the 8th century. And this is, this is what I highlighted in green, uh, I hope appropriately. Uh, some of my colleagues in uh, Belfast would disagree. Uh, but in the 7th century, expertise in Ireland comes from this conflict, from this discussion about which of these Easter reckonings is the most appropriate one. But it's not only that. If you think uh, in broader terms of uh, Irish history and Irish literary history, um, if you uh, look at grammatical texts, if you look at exegetical texts, um, just look at hagiography. hagiography. Hagiography in Ireland, as far as we know, starts roughly in the 650s, uh, and the major texts by Miracu, Tyrocon, Adolfnon, Cogitosos, they are all produced in the second half of the uh, 7th century. There's something major going on in the second half of the 7th century. It's not just computers, but also computers, and computers because uh, you, have to, you have three tables and you have to figure out which of these is the most practical one. Um, okay, this leads us then, what we know is, and this is what B tells us, and other uh, historians at the time, if <coughs> you wanted to learn something in the 7th century, you sailed to Ireland. If you were in Anglo-Saxon England and you wanted to learn something, you went to an Irish monastery in Ireland, uh, from Francia as well. So we know from Bede that there was major expertise in Ireland, um, which then somebody like myself who studied uh, mathematics and history, uh, the, the immediate question then obviously is, so what is this expertise? What is the evidence for this expertise? Is it just a claim made by Bede and others? Or what expertise did they have? The first method we can apply to find this material is we go by script, paleography. Um, just look through the corpus of manuscripts that are written in an Irish hand. Because something written by an Irishman could potentially mean that it is Irish knowledge of the time. Problem, obviously, with Irish manuscripts, as, as most people in the room will be able to tell you, um, not so much has survived. Um, we only have five early medieval scientific manuscripts written in an Irish hand. Not more than that. And um, that, uh, and that the manuscripts themselves pose, pose certain problems. Um, the first one, the most famous one, especially among Celticists, would be, be the Vienna Beat and the Karlsruhe Beat. Uh, they are the only ones where we have full manuscripts. Uh, they are famous among Celticists because they are heavily glossed, as you can see here, and uh, quite a few of these glosses are in Old Irish. The problem is the base text is bead. It's not Irish knowledge. Um, we, don't, we get some in interesting scientific knowledge through the glosses, and somebody desperately needs to do uh, work because of these five manuscripts, four are heavily glossed. Um, the glosses have been studied for the language component, not necessarily for their scientific component. And what you need to do with the beaten glosses, somebody needs to write, there's no definite study of beaten glosses, generally. Somebody needs to do that would be an amazing PhD. Um, <laughs> but putting not only, uh, putting vernacular um, um, glosses into context as much as their scientific content. Nobody has worked on the scientific content here. Um, they can potentially give us some clues. Uh, I went um, through a few of them with Jacobo, who is my um, old Irish advisor, uh, and um, they don't strike me as particularly innovative. So these texts do not really bring us um, that far, uh, and all of the other manuscripts that we have in an Irish hand, um, just like this one, is just a one-pager. They give you a sense that it's not just text, it's diagrams as well. Uh, at the same time, this is all known knowledge. 
This is, uh, this is Carolingian knowledge, the previous one was Beden knowledge, is not original Irish knowledge. So through manuscripts written in an Irish hand, we don't get to Irish uh, knowledge. But we'll, this gives you an indication of that um, not everything is scanned at the moment. Um, if, you go to, if you want to look at Vatican manuscripts, quite a few of them, we still work from, uh, obviously, microfilm scans. Um, this is probably the most interesting one. It's a Nancy fragment. Um, most interesting because these algorithms um, are standard, but not in that phrasing. So this could be the only page of um, co Irish uh, copatistica written in Irish hand that could be more or less original, but it's just this one page. Uh, and I don't believe it's, it's uh, originally Irish thought, it's just thought that came through Ireland, same as with me. Um, but tells us other things. Um, these manuscripts uh, give us a good uh, indication of um, how was science taught in Irish monastic schools. Because they are so heavily glossed in the vernacular, uh, we got the sense that um, teaching of complex matters, just like um, the workings and mechanisms of a lunar calendar and so on, if it becomes too tricky and too complex and too detailed, if your audience is native Irish speaking, if you're a native Irish speaker yourself, and you want to make sure that your students understand that um, difficult, complex concept, then you just explain it briefly in your own native tongue rather than in Latin. So monastic teaching um, seems to have been, when it, certainly when it came to become, became too complex, uh, have been th probably done in uh, Irish. What they are not good for is uh, what did Iron, Irish scientists think, what did they accomplish, what were their original ideas. These five manuscripts don't lead us anywhere. Uh, what did Irish scientists contribute to the history of science? Again, um, these um, five manuscripts don't show us anything. So what I will be doing is now is to give you a rough sense of how scientists, uh, the scientific mind developed in medieval Ireland from roughly uh, 450 to 800. At the beginning, they had nothing but this. They got an Easter table. This, and actually, we know about the dates of Easter uh, as they were celebrated by Columba, by potentially Patrick, uh, Bridget, if she was an historic person, um, by the Amar propagandist, Adolf Non, uh, Columba, and so on. We know about which dates and which dates they celebrated Easter only since the discovery of this Easter table. And that gives you already an indication of the progress made within the past 40 years. This Easter table, Darby discovered that in 1985, uh, took some time to reconstruct it, Dan then uh, reconstructed it convincingly in 1993. Only since 1993 we have uh, indication of when Easter was celebrated in Ireland in this uh, crucial period. And we know the basics of this one of the three Easter reckonings, one of the most crucial ones. The problem really uh, is what happens, uh, uh, what happened throughout uh, Christianity, whenever there was um, strife within the church, uh, that was covered up later on uh, when unity was achieved. They basically got rid of all the evidence that there ever was strife because what you achieve for is uh, Christian unity. If you just look at the numbers here, uh, and there's a reason why it, it, it uh, took some time to reconstruct it, then actually uh, did a computer program to crack the code, if you like. Um, this is what Irish scientists in the 5th and 6th century were faced with themselves. They had nothing but this, and they had to reconstruct how does, how does an Easter table like this work. I always get um, remarks then afterwards, yeah, well, but one, once you've got a table, um, you don't need to do the calculations yourself anymore. Why do you need to understand the system behind it um, if you already have all the dates? Here are all the dates for Easter, and then that's fine. Um, well, first of all, that... The comment is usually done by non-scientists themselves. The scientific mind wants to understand. So once you have the table, you want to make sure that you understand how this works. Plus, as you can see here, and Dan can assure you how many scribal mistakes are only on this one page. Uh, scribal mistakes, uh, mistaking uh, a five for a two happens all the time. You need to be able to double check your data. Uh, and in order to do that, you need to understand the system. So the achievement of Irish scientists uh, in the early period is understanding the system that lies behind these numbers, which in itself 
think about how do you do science without having any basis. You just here have numbers and you have to uh, crack the code for that. That is not easy. Um, so again, we know this only since 1985. There were some good theories before how Irish Easter was calculated beforehand, um, but in the end, nobody really cracked the code because nobody had this evidence. Um, this then basically, I mentioned that earlier, the need to understand the uh, mechanics underlying Easter calculations, that is, again, and that is important, the mathematical modeling of astronomical phenomena, the course of the sun and the moon phases, um, they led to, and then the need to compare competing systems for the calculation of Easter, that led to Irish expertise in computers, which in the seventh century was unrivaled in the West. Again, that it was unrivaled in the West, we only figured that out at the moment. There were all these, always these claims, we didn't have the evidence for it. This is a nice uh, uh, table that we just discovered uh, three months back, really. Um, Jacobo uh, Bizani in um, Galway had another really nice discovery. Or, um, he studied a computistical manuscript um, that I've never studied before. Um, he looked at it closely, he thought there may be some Irish elements in it. Um, I then uh, look through the text. Uh, I'll come back to, to that manuscript a bit later on. This is our best table um, that we have to date of comparing two Easter reckonings. One Easter reckoning here, the other Easter reckoning here. Um, this is important because none of these two Easter reckonings is the so-called Irish reckoning. I told you earlier about the Irish reckoning, Victorious of Aquitaine, Dionysius Exiguus. Victorious of Aquitaine and Dionysius Exiguus did Easter reckonings for the Roman Church. Bede wants to make us believe that these two reckonings are more or less the same. If they were more or less the same, nobody would have the need to compare them. And this is our best indication that what, the, what people did at the time is comparing these two um, reckonings. This is a manuscript from the 11th century that gives you a sense that some of these, fortunately, some of these um, comparisons survived for quite some time. Um, how do we then know about Irish having unrivaled expertise in these computers? Um, three major texts, and this is now the period of what we call the computistical textbook. The Irish were the first one to compose, as you need for grammar, but for grammar, for example, they had uh, Prision and Donatus. They had the textbook. There was no textbook for the science of how to calculate Easter. They uh, invented that textbook for the monastic schools themselves. Um, the first uh, textbook is known for quite some time, um, for uh, 140 years at this stage, because this grumpy looking old man uh, discovered it in 1878. Um, this is your Ebenezer Scrooge of um, German academia or German early medieval uh, history, Bruno Kruj. Uh, and he's actually an Ebenezer Scrooge for exactly the same reason as Ebenezer Scrooge's life story, uh, because he discovered this text when he was 21. He published it when he was, or he published about it when he was uh, 23. That gave him some fame. Uh, he was immediately hired by the MGH, then in Berlin, uh, now in Munich, obviously, but then in Berlin. Uh, he's from Görlitz, which is uh, in the old days with a steam train five hours from Berlin. Um, his boss, Weitz, would give him one day off per year for Christmas, which five hours on the train uh, back and forth would not, uh, he could not make it back to, to, um, uh, back to Görlitz, to his family for Christmas, so he stayed in Berlin working. That made, at least that's a legend that is still told in, at the MGH. Uh, whether that's true or not, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's a good story though, and that, that would make him your Ebenezer Scrooge. He always looked grumpy, and he was, when you read his, um, uh, his academic uh, articles, uh, he always, uh, like to be venomous, he always liked to attack people. So maybe that comes from that time, I don't know. But keep in mind that um, the Munich computers, that is, that's, as Liam said, this is the, the text I studied for my uh, dissertation, um, which was fairly frustrating at times. Uh, I sometimes find that editing work is not necessarily appreciated enough because with editing a text, you can't hide. You have to read the whole text and you have to understand the whole text. If I write, if I write uh, a dissertation, uh, about a topic of my choosing, and I can't get my head around to certain aspects, I, I just leave out that chapter. You can't leave out any chapter here. So it takes ages to, to uh, crack the code of, of every single chapter in, in the book. Um, 
This text is extremely important because it's the only one we can date. That's why this needs to be the center of the study of computers in early Middle Island generally, because we know exactly when it was written. That is key. And it's the only text in the Latin West um, that compared all three Easter egg that, that's, that's got my attraction to the text, that this has three different mathematical models and compares them. Otherwise, you only have two. This is the only one that compares all three. So that's, that's key. Um, Darby then, in 1982, uh, discovered a second computistical hand, uh, textbook. We still discuss the dates of them. Um, there's no um, consensus achieved uh, at the moment. I obviously give you, give you my dates. Um, keep in mind that the only text we can really date with certainty is the Munich computers. And then uh, the Einzelen computers, which was then discovered in 2006. So this gives you a sense, okay, the Munich computers was known for um, over 140 years, but still what's in it, um, we really um, studied that in detail only over the past 10, 15 years, uh, and then that gave us a good insight into what um, Irish computistical textbook must look like, what are the criteria, what are the elements that you need to look out for, and then you can find more. We're still in the process of finding more. Uh, interestingly enough, nobody, uh, or quite only very few people um, would fund us for that because they, everybody says, this is 19th century. You find the text, um, uh, come up with a good new theory about these texts, uh, then that's fine. I can easily come up with uh, 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 loads of theories that give me funding, but the problem is these theories will be, uh, will be in the bin uh, once we find new texts. We first need to know what the corpus is before we start um, doing the theories. <coughs> So this is the problem we're facing at the moment. We don't have enough time for it because we need more money for it. Um, just to give you a sense of how we work, this is Einsiedeln, uh, the monastery where uh, I discovered this, this Einsiedeln computers on the day when, when I looked at the manuscript. Um, they kick you out over lunchtime, which I find frustrating. You only have a few hours there anyway, but the monks want to be left alone. They've got their, uh, their lunch then for an hour. So what do you do then? You walk around the monastery and take pictures. Um, this is what this is our lab. What our lab looks like, our working <laughs> space. Uh, this is the monastery in um, uh, or the monastic library in Einsiedeln and Pater Odus, just taking out uh, that manuscript because it was on display. Um, and this is what such a text look like, looks like. This is the Einsiedeln computers. Um, as Liam said, the Einsiedeln computers is interesting uh, because it also has old Irish in it. One of our biggest problem, obviously, is to prove that these texts were written by Irishmen. The problem with, um, that we had previously with the paleography, okay, it's uh, a manuscript written in an Irish script. What does that mean? Is it written by an Irishman? Is it written by somebody trained by an Irishman? Is it written on the, uh, in an Irish foundation on the continent? Is it written in Ireland? Whereas if you've got old Irish or the Irish language in an otherwise completely Latin text, embedded in the Irish text. You, you know that your audience will understand Irish. So the person who wrote it knew Irish and he expected his audience to know Irish. In a monastery on the continent, they would normally be too mixed. You would have Franks there, you would have Anglo-Saxons there, a Germanic-based language rather than a Celtic-based language. Um, so you would not necessarily do that. Um, this makes most sense, at least in Ireland. So this makes us comfortable that these texts are written in Ireland and through the Munich computers we know at what time. Um, what I would like to draw your attention to is this one here. This is probably the most famous uh, passage now of the text. We still have no edition of the text because uh, I don't find the time and I don't find somebody else to, to, to do it. Uh, we need a good edition of this text as well because it's one of our key texts. Um, just a blow up of that. These are the first uh, 13 old Irish um, ordinates basically explaining the Julian calendar. That gives you a sense of how important the, the Julian calendar itself is counterintuitive, if you like, because you count backwards. You have three marker days. The calends is the first day of a, um, a year, uh, uh, of a month, sorry. Um, the knowns, depending on which month you're in, uh, in this case it's uh, January, so it's the fifth day. The Ides, you know that from when Julius Caesar died, the Ides of March but then you count backwards. The second day before the Ides, the third day before the Ides, the fourth day before the Ides. That is counterintuitive. It's basically, um, the Romans needed to, to, to know how many days till the next feast day because the feast day was a, a market day. So they needed to know how, how many days. But to understand that system, um, basically the Irish 
teacher, he had this textbook said, okay, the first is called canons, the second is called the fourth uh, nones, uh, the third day of the month is called the third before the nones that gets lost, just the third nones then, and so on and so on. So, um, to me, that wasn't a, a major discovery because I'm interested in, in mathematical algorithms. Um, Jacobo, whom I showed that uh, on the day, he, he was um, uh, celebrating the whole night, I suppose, uh, because apparently these discoveries aren't made that often. Um, but you see, what is interesting here really is the idea of how do you teach in school? And what you could, what we would probably do here, or what, the, um, what they could have done at the time as well, is setting them off in different colors. But what the uh, author here wanted to make sure is, um, just to give you a sense, um, this column is different from this column. You should not read these together as a line. So how do you set columns uh, separately? You can do that with color, but you can also do it with language. So it's, it's a di didactical tool, basically. So this is more or less what the books uh, look like that, that we, we uh, l uh, look at. Um, are there more textbooks? Yes, there are. We just need to find them. Uh, we just need uh, the time for it, and we need the money for it. Um, this is an interesting one that uh, Darby and myself uh, work on at the moment, discovered by Darby. It also gives you a sense where we find uh, stuff. This is a fly leaf, uh, a binding fragment. So basically, if um, 40, in this case, 15th century bookbinders um, try to strengthen the binding of their book, gospel book, legal tract, whatever else, by um, getting vellum from manuscripts that were not used anymore and um, gluing them into the book binding, basically. And those were then uh, taken out uh, afterwards. And this gives you a sense of um, every library would have shoe boxes full of these little fragments, usually one pages. Uh, and the only part that we are interested in, in this one, for example, this is one, two, three, four different fragments glued together. The part we are interested in is this one here. So um, there are, there must, there's more like that out there. We just need to find it. Uh, but it's usually, it could potentially be fragments. It's not necessarily always full books. Here we are in the fortunate position that we've got 12 fragments. With these 12 fragments, we get a sense. Um, from different parts of what used to be a computistical textbook. And because it's from different parts, we get the sense it used to be a, a proper textbook rather than just a chapter on one phenomenon like uh, the leap here or something like that. Um, this is the one that Jacobo uh, started to work on uh, two, uh, two or three months ago. Uh, this is another way of finding Irish computistica. It's an interesting, um, it's not necessarily the place where you would look for 7th or 8th century Irish signs. It's a book from Ripoll in Catalonia, northern Spain, uh, written in the 11th century. What this author did, um, he had three authorities, and from these auth three authorities, he composed uh, a major <coughs> encyclopedia of computistica, if you like. The three authorities are Isidore, because that person uh, is from Spain, Bede, because he wrote the most popular text, and one other text. And this one other text is, uh, if you, what we now do is we take all the uh, chapters out that seem to have come from this one uh, Irish text and we piece them together and we'll see what comes up. We haven't done that work yet, but this is another way that people just um, took bits and pieces from uh, what used to be a textbook uh, and incorporated that in their new compilation and we now take it out again. Uh, Paul will be particularly interested in, in these two uh, chapters because this is what you find in the Liber Khomeini. It's uh, the exact same thing and we only have um, four, five copies of um, these chapters. So that makes it interesting here and this is, uh, it's in, it's a, um, this also gives you a sense, I'm not sure if you can uh, read it, but there are certain, even just Latin terms that we are looking for. And we know this, this Latin uh, term here, Luna Abortiva, this was invented in 7th century Ireland, uh, and it usually just um, found its way into um, Irish texts. This is one of our indicators that we, uh, one of our characteristics that we now get a sense that um, these, wherever these appear, must have come at least, they represent Irish thought, whether thirds. Uh, fourth, fifth generation or original uh, that re remains to be seen. But we are looking for these kind of terms. Luna abortiva basically means a lunation 29 days between the calends of a month. You have the first of a month, that would be your last day of a lunation, of, of a, a moon phase. 
Uh, it starts on the second of the month and it ends before the next first. That is uh, that concept which is very, very rare. That gives us an idea of which kind of text uh, to look for. And here you see beat. So what this author did, basically, he took chapters from one text. He then took um, chapters on the similar concept from beat and then from Isidore. And then he thought, we'll have everything compiled together. And why would anybody in the 11th century be interested in that, and especially in Spain? Um, what happens here is quite interesting, uh, is that Arabic science slowly but surely makes its way, its way in the, into the Latin West. So what people do at, at that time is they compile textbooks on old science and textbooks on new science. And this is a textbook on old science, yeah, which then includes whatever they think is interesting, including from potentially a, a, a 7th or 8th century Irish text. Yeah. We can reconstruct the way that this, this concept made it to Catalonia through Brittany, the Loire Valley, the Loire Valley uh, um, had a, a major interest in this brings us from the textbooks. The textbooks, this is, we'll find frustrating. The textbooks end at roughly 750. And we don't know that much what's, what's going on in Irish medieval science afterwards. Um, from, I would call the period 750 to 900 uh, would be the period of the Irish scholars in the Carolingian Empire. I just read out this quote from Not Gabalbulus of St. Gall uh, in his uh, life of. Uh, um, Charlemagne, or rather the deeds of Charlemagne, uh, written in 880s, that gives you a sense of um, the Irish scholars on the continent at the time. They brought with them scientific uh, concepts. When he, Charlemagne, had begun to rule alone in the western parts of the world, and the study of letters were everywhere almost forgotten, so that the worship of the true God was weak, it happened that two Scots, which Scoti obviously in Latin means Irishmen, the two Scots, Irishmen from Ireland, came with British traders to the shore of Gaul, and they were men most wonderfully instructed in secular, this is important for us, secular learning means science as well, secular uh, and in sacred texts. When they displayed nothing for sale, they used to shout to the crowds who had uh, come to buy things, if anyone is eager for wisdom, let him come to us and receive it, for that is what we have for sale. And he, Charlemagne, received this answer uh, when he, Charlemagne, received his answer, he was filled with great joy, and first he kept them both with him for a short time. Later, when he was compelled to go on military campaigns, he ordered one of them, named Clement, to live in Gaul, and he entrusted to him uh, many boys, very noble and middling and wretched, and ordered uh, that they be fed and given suitable places to live. The second, who was called, um, I left out the name, um, he sent to Italy and granted him the monastery of St. Augustine near the city of Pavia, so that whoever w wishes might gather, they had to be taught by him. So basically, you have Irish scholars were, um, they had a major reputation in the Carolingian Empire, um, and they were, big, they were, they were given um, extremely important um, monastic centers, especially monastic schools. They would um, uh, head over these schools and they would teach then um, the upcoming Carolingian elite. Who do we know by name? And the frustrating thing about our textbooks is we have no name. They're all anonymous. Um, whereas uh, in the Carolingian period, we know at least two major Irish scientists by name, Dungal and Dickwill. Dungal is famous for writing a letter to Charlemagne about two solar eclipses allegedly happening in 810. One solar eclipse was um, see, uh, the Carolingians could see themselves, the other, or observe themselves, and the other one um, was basically related to them by Byzantine, uh, by Byzantine emb embassy at Charlemagne's court at, at the same time, and Charlemagne was curious, could that really happen? Could there be two solar eclipses in one year? Is that possible or not? Um, so he asked Dungal to, to uh, discuss that. Um, Dick Will is the other major scholar who wrote uh, a tract on the measures of the Earth, which basically is a tract on um, geometry, but geometry and geography was more or less the same thing. You did geometry to measure the world, uh, or to measure uh, parts of the world. And the other one is called Liber de Astronomia, which, um, and this is where we go into astronomy. Uh, it is not astronomy, uh, it's mathematics, but this gives you a sense of um, that at least here there seemed to be an astronomy component in it which we don't have before. Question here for us here again is, is this genuinely Irish knowledge? An Irish person 
working on the continent, um, whatever he writes down on the continent li after living on the continent for a couple of years, if not decades, is that knowledge that he acquired on the continent or is that knowledge that he acquired in Ireland before leaving? Uh, very, very difficult to, to assess. This is why the three textbooks are our key witnesses. Um, but this brings, this created a problem for me, and this is uh, um, the, the problem that is in the title of the talk. Um, there's a major imbalance between what's going on around 700 and around 800. The textbooks that we have are purely mathematical. <coughs> they really just talk about the mathematical model. They don't talk about astronomical phenomena and how to explain them. They're just interested in the mathematical models behind these uh, uh, phenomena, whereas then in Charlemagne's time, Irish scholars seem to have been expert in astronomy. So there's something um, major um, happening between 700 and 800. Um, what I'm interested in is why do these Irish scholars at around 700 do not touch astronomy? Why do they not have astronomy? Um, first of all, we need to find the watershed for that, and this gives you an... an uh, uh, a good background, a good insight into the um, medieval scientific mind. This is uh, a manuscript again that uh, Jacobo alerted me to when he was uh, in uh, the Bibliothèque Nationale uh, in Paris. Um, he studied texts, computistical texts with uh, Breton glosses. Uh, and he said, Imo, I think there are Irish elements in it. Uh, have a look uh, through it. Um, I found a dating clause in it. The dating clause is embedded in the calculation of, in the oldest or the earliest eclipse prediction, calculation of uh, eclipses or attempts to calculate eclipses that we have in the Latin West. Um, this is the only reason why we know when this text was written. And the author basically says, um, a total solar eclipse occurred in 664, and the next one should occur in the year that he's writing, and he uh, um, explicitly calls it Anus Presence, uh, 754. <coughs> that is 90 years later. He calls it 3 times 30 years later. Why 3 times 30? What this man did is, again, keep in mind there's no, they have no background knowledge. They have no basis for their knowledge. All they have is what they see in the sky and uh, what they read in the Bible. And this is exactly what this man did. Um, he knew through the Synoptic Gospels and then the Church Fathers and so on um, that Matthew says that there was what is potentially an eclipse uh, at the time when Christ was crucified. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. This is the Friday uh, of crucifixion. This, since Christ was believed to have lived either 30 or 30, uh, either 31 or 34 years, depending on which gospel you believe in, if, if you believe in the synoptics or in, in um, John, um, he reconstructed that as an eclipse occurred in the year 34 on the 25th of March because this is um, the date when people believe Christ was crucified. This gives you the data of one eclipse. It doesn't work uh, astronomically, but that's a different matter. What he ha has here is one date, and he has another date from his own records uh, in Ireland, from the Annals of Ulster, an eclipse in the ninth hour, 1st of May, 664. He's got a major problem with the calendar date, it should occur on the same date, uh, and he has that, that uh, sort of a problem. Um, but what he thinks is, one eclipse in, 30, in the year 34, one eclipse in the year 664, how many years do you have in between uh, 630? This is 20 times 30 years, so he thinks maybe every 30 years uh, an eclipse occurs. So what he does, exactly 90, um, he actually does it on both dates, um, 90 years after the eclipse that is recorded in his own chronicle, he uh, goes to a mountain, has a look uh, in the sky, no eclipse. Uh, on both dates, no eclipse. And he gets extremely frustrated. But it's, he's actually quite intelligent and interesting uh, trying to justify why, why was there no eclipse. Uh, he says, well, maybe the eclipse is in the southern hemisphere and not here, which is an intelligent uh, thing to say, uh, and so on. So he's, he's got uh, intelligence intelligent arguments for why that uh, could have happened. And again, I mean, we would call this today an empirical approach. What do you do if you don't have any text? You look for data and you try to reconstruct <coughs> something. So the mind, the scientific mind at the time works similar to what we do, just you don't have anything to work from. So what they got, what they, they could get, they used. Um, the question now is, 
Why do these computistical textbooks of around 700 do not include astronomy? This is an Irish text of 754, written roughly 50 years later, that is about astronomy, how to calculate an eclipse. You have nothing about astronomy in the earlier textbooks. Why is that? Um, five potential answers to them, I'm, and I'm not sure. I just give you ideas, and uh, you'll decide yourself afterwards. Um, first of all, uh, the obvious one, loss of text. Maybe there were plenty of astronomical texts within Ireland. Um, they just haven't survived. Uh, this is actually... Uh, this would be similar to what's going on then in the 11th century. You've got a textbook on mathematics, you have textbooks on astronomy. You don't need to mention astronomy in the textbook on mathematics because you do it separately. Fine, but then we would need to have it. Then one text at least must survive uh, because there are roughly 50 computistical texts between 700 and 800 and not a single purely astronomical one. It doesn't exist. So a loss of text. Um, okay, but why then do we have all these computistical texts? It's the same argument that, that is too often mentioned for the artis liberalis. Um, astronomy, geometry, arithmetic, music. Um, people keep on saying that the artis liberalis were the basis for the monastic curriculum in, in the 7th and 8th century. It doesn't work because we don't have a single geom geometrical text from the period, but we have all these texts, uh, what we call computistical. So whenever uh, an, an astronomical phenomenon is, is important, they would include that into their textbook on how to calculate Easter, uh, but they would not produce a separate text. So I don't think this necessarily works. Um, limited interest in astronomy. Maybe, maybe they had no interest in astronomy. That is not true either. Um, because this is the eclipse that I already mentioned. Um, this actually tells us, this is now from the NASA website. NASA fortunately calculates uh, the eclipses for us, which what is extremely important that these people could not calculate eclipses retrospectively. If there's a record of an eclipse, it must have been observed at the time. There's no other way, right? This eclipse here of 664 is extremely interesting and important because the total visibility or to totality of the eclipse is in Northern Ireland and then uh, all the way through Northumbria and then all on the continent only in parts which were not Christianized at the time, which means they did not have the written word. They could not record it at the time. So this eclipse must have been recorded for the first time here. Uh, it's in the Irish Annals, uh, Annals of Ulster. At the time, we believe at least these kind of entries to have been produced here in Iona. So close enough, uh, could have been uh, visible there. Um, and afterwards, you have at least eight for the next 70 years. That is an article <coughs> by... Uh, I just took the information from an article by Dan McCarthy and Aidan Breen. Eight lunar and solar eclipses uh, are recorded in the Irish Annals. The Frankish Annals, they start slightly later, and 703 is the first annual entry in, in Francia. It takes them quite a while to start recording astronomical phenomena, uh, probably getting that idea again from your Irish scholars. Uh, they start in roughly the 760. This is why this could not have been written somewhere else earlier. So this just shows you there's this eclipse, this eclipse, a total eclipse, right in the middle of day. Uh, think in, in eschatological terms and so on as well. Uh, that creates a huge interest, huge anxieties, uh, whatever. If there was an interest in astronomy. That is not the reason why there's no astronomy in this textbook. Um, the other aspect, and that, that's um, now we're getting slowly but surely to the key aspects um, av availability of knowledge. And I, I really want you to appreciate that the key text for astronomy is Ptolemy's Almagest. Ptolemy's Almagest is not known in the Latin uh, West before the 12th century. Uh, comes into the Latin West through two channels, um, through uh, a Greek and the uh, Arabic translation. That's why it's still called Almagest. It's obviously uh, an Arabic word. So before the 12th century, no Ptolemy. What we find so fascinating is how do you do astronomy without Ptolemy? How do you do it? The same works for all the other disciplines. How do you do mathematics without Euclid? How do you do philosophy without Ar Aristotle? How do you do medicine without Galen? Um, this is, without having a basis, you need to have probably an even um, sharper mind than if you are provided with all the texts because you have to do everything from scratch. So we always talk about the dark ages here. I don't think it works because they did something on the basis of nothing. Um, 
We have three other key texts, Hygenius, uh, Martianus, Capella, uh, Calcidius. Martianus, Capella, and Calcidius, they are basically philosophical texts, but they mention um, astronomical phenomena. This is why they give you some ba basics in astronomy. Again, they are not known before the early 9th century. So they could potentially be, they did not have the basics that they could include in the textbook. Our one key problem is Pliny. Now, Pliny we need to study more closely because Pliny is known uh, by Bede in, the, in roughly the same time when the Irish textbooks were written. And whether he was known in 7th century Ireland, uh, that needs to be, the more text we'll find, the more background we get to that. But this will be key, whether Pliny was known in 7th century Ireland or not. Uh, we have no major evidence at the moment, but I would not necessarily rule it out. Why would I not rule it out? Um, because we know of other texts, um, and this is now just to give you a sense of how they calculated at the time. Um, these are computistical argumenta that were known in Ireland at the time, but not copied. No were copied. They didn't like them. So they had knowledge which they didn't include in their textbooks. So that happened. How do we know that? Um, just to give you a sense of what these uh, algorithms were about, this is the most basic one. Um, how do you calculate a b sextile or a leap year? How do you know that uh, 2015 is not a leap year? That algorithm basically says, um, if you want to know when a b sextile days occurs or a leap year in that case, uh, sense, take the years from the Lord, say 525. These divide by four. If nothing remains, there's a B6 star day. If one, two, or three remain, there is no B6 star day. 2015 divided by four is not divisible by four. You have a rest of three. It's not a B6 star year. Next year, 2016, you can divide by four. Uh, the rest is, is zero. Um, that's why it is a B6 star year. So it's very simple um, mathematics. Um, the Irish did not copy that. They had it available to them, they did not copy that. They didn't use it. Why did they not use it? They did not like AD. What we do today, they thought, no, AD makes no sense. Why would, why would you start a linear timeline from the birth of Christ? They had linear timelines from the creation of the world, that makes perfect sense. From the um, uh, crucifixion or resurrection, that makes perfect sense because a new age starts uh, with Christ taking away all the sins. But with Christ's birth, no new age starts. That does not make much sense. Plus, it was inaccurate as well, and they knew it. So uh, that's why they didn't use it. But this is actually, in terms of transmission of scientific knowledge, these, um, uh, these uh, calendrical algorithms are the only corpus of text where you can reconstruct uh, a transmission throughout the earliest centuries of the Middle Ages, and you can prove it. For Pliny, you could guess, OK, maybe it was known in Ireland, maybe not here because they updated these algorithms to the present year whenever they copied it, which in itself needs a certain bit of scientific knowledge and expertise. So we'll have dating clauses for 525, 562, 581, uh, 265, that's this one here, uh, 275, 289, and so on. It goes all the way through. So here you can prove and you can even map uh, because you know where they were copied at least, you can map how this scientific knowledge was transmitted throughout Western Europe in the two earliest, uh, two earliest centuries of uh, the Middle Ages. This you can't do for any author or anything. This is our, our best witness. The Irish had it in the seventh century. They didn't use it because they didn't like the idea of AD. In all the three textbooks that we have, there's only one mention of AD, basically saying, okay, in, in this one Easter table, you find this column, but don't worry about it. <laughs> and that's it. There's no other mentioning of ADU whatsoever. So they, they really did not, did not necessarily like that. What I think is, uh, could potentially have been a problem is this. Um, the old reckoning that they were exposed to before they adopted Victorious and then Dionysius. The oldest reckoning, the Easter table I showed you at the beginning. That is the oldest reckoning that they were exposed to. Um, they followed that for 300 years. It later on become, became a political issue that grew increasingly uh, inaccurate. This 84-year cycle <coughs> the table uh, has a margin of an astronomical uh, error of 1.28 days per 84-year period. That is, uh, it, it basically gets inaccurate by a day every 84 years. So after a few centuries, that accumulates. And when Iona finally abandons this reckoning in 716, 
that accumulates to a difference of four to five days between your calculated moon and what you see in the sky. That is a huge problem. I'll just uh, uh, show you this uh, chart here. Um, the calculated moon in, in, seven, um, uh, in 710, the calculated full moon, was on the 13th of April. The one you see in the sky is on the 18th of April, five days later. So that can create a problem. Uh, if you ever taught um, students who, would, who uh, ask too many questions, this would certainly be a question, especially for a monk who sits outside of his monastery, had to uh, sit outside of the monastery at night, uh, looking at the moon uh, on a regular basis and realizing that this is not the full moon. That's a major problem here. What do you do then? You just don't mention astronomy in your textbook. <laughs> <laughs> That's potentially one way of, of looking at it. And B tells you so. B, B tells you, and B only has a problem of one to two days rather than four to five. Four to five is big. One day you may not necessarily see, if, if you try to figure out the full moon yourself, uh, you're, uh, you, there, there's a variance of one day. Two days you can, you can see, no, this is, this is two days too early or this is two days too late. Uh, one day is tricky. So B only has a problem of one or two days, not of four to five. B says this. Um, it should be pointed out that the calculation causes the moon sometimes to be visibly older than it is reckoned to be. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, now, if someone pursuing this question more seriously were to say that in the company of witnesses, which is important, you don't just claim it yourself, you are witnesses for it, uh, he had seen the new moon shine forth two days before the calculated moon, he would demand that we explain the cause of this. At this point, our insignificant speed, uh, lest it be defeated uh, by its weakness, will run for help to the fathers and indeed to God's authority. And therefore, it is not proper for any of the faithful to say that it's not. <laughs> and in between, he has a long list of, of um, biblical uh, authorities and the church fathers. Basically say, you know, you, you just have to trust them. You can't prove it otherwise. You're right, I know, but um, this is, this is uh, all we have. And our Easter table is God-given. Don't question God with it. So he brushes uh, his students off by the statement, potentially... The Irish scholars did not want to have the same kind of conflict, so they just don't mention astronomy. Could, could, could potentially be a legacy of that. I'm not sure if, if that is, but there was a major problem in 7th century Ireland because of this discrepancy. Um, and one point to make here is uh, Bede is always heralded for being this great scientist. He does that all the time. Whenever he doesn't have an answer, uh, he refers to the church fathers or to the Bible. And no, no of the Irish textbooks has this theological component. It's strictly about... Um, your algorithms. It's not about uh, what's in the Bible. Um, the one I still favor best, and that's 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 more or less the summary of the talk, I suppose. I still believe. I, I guess what what normally happens with science, and this is potentially what could have happened here, it's simply a progression in your scientific endeavor. You don't try to do everything at the same time. You start by deciphering the Easter tables. Once you decipher the Easter tables. Then you uh, reconstruct the underlying mathematical models and you write textbooks about that mathematical model. Once you have accomplished that, you can ask further questions, astronomical questions like, can we predict eclipses and so on? But that is the next step. So the progression from, say, 700 to 750 then potentially is just a progression in you know more and with uh, more acquired knowledge, you can simply ask bigger questions and that leads you then from the mathematical model to more to the astronomical aspects. That's it. Thanks very much.
Yeah, the first question is a question of authority, I suppose, as well. So it's not about what is the right or, or wrong date of, of uh, Easter, it's what do you agree is the right or wrong date of Easter. Yeah. And um, what the interesting aspect about probably Irish scientists at the time is they wanted to check these tables themselves rather than just going for what an authority tells them. So um, say Rome advocates a certain table, they would get that table, but then they would test it themselves and see, uh, and mathematical or astronomical accuracy is just one of the things that is tested. Other aspects are, for example, how, how do, uh, are theological aspects, how does it relate to uh, the data, there's not much data in the, in the Bible, but there is data and the, the Bible is an important text, so they would uh, compare that with that. And then a monastic community or a wider church, in, in Ireland it's the northern half versus the southern half, they would decide to adopt one table over the other because they consider that more accurate. But what is accurate is completely up to you. The 84-year um, cycle, which becomes astronomically inaccurate, is mathematically a very, very neat uh, accomplishment because pressed within 84 years, you have an 84-year cycle rather than 532 years that you can't really get your head around. 84 years is, um, is a lifetime of a person. Um, it is mathematically extremely nicely constructed. Easter falls only within the period of a lunar month, 29 days rather than 35 days, which has no uh, relation to the lunar month. So there are more considerations going into that. And what is the correct date? You decide then within your monastic community or you uh, adhere to an authority. So that, that's probably the question there. Um, the second question, calculations. Uh, that's a very tricky one um, and it's actually interesting that they knew some of these fractions better but they would always go with the approximation they generally hated fractions because try to do it yourself with Roman numerals uh, on a wax tablet uh, that is that is not that easy so um, I could have shown you some some examples of, of how to do that but uh, calculating with high numbers generally is problematic then when you go to, into high fractions, you don't even have the terminology for that. So that is, uh, that's why they use the approximation. And uh, all these calculations are done with integers, never with fractions. So your lunar month is not 29.5 days. It's uh, alternating between 29 and 30. That averages out to 29.5. Uh, but you always calculate with integers because the rest becomes too complex and, and complicated. Yeah. And these Easter tables are, in that sense, beautifully designed. But each one of them has a problem. The, the last one that then uh, is followed throughout the Middle Ages that has major flaws and problems. But this is why the Gregorian calendar reform then comes in uh, at the end. Oh, one other thing. Was it, you mentioned is an 8th century scholar who knew the world and wasn't collapsed. Is that true? I knew they knew in Alexandria in Egypt, but I thought that was forgotten about the uh, arts. Everybody knew it. Everyone knew it. Every intellectual knew it. Um, not the not the uh, person on the street, if you like, but uh, a monastic scientist. They all knew it. There was no doubt about that. Um, you have uh, so, well, uh, probably popular belief versus versus um, scientists. At any, what what I what I try to demonstrate with that as well is a good point. What I try to demonstrate with that as well, there's always this this idea of in the dark ages. Um, people were just stupid. No, they weren't. They had the same scientific mind and the same scientific interest. They just didn't have the basis for it. They, they, um, once they get these texts, they do amazing things with their texts. Ptolemy, for example, uh, comes in and within a year, uh, people work with Ptolemy. Why do they, how do they do that? Because their mind is trained in, 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 in uh, these kind of uh, scientific thought over centuries. So at any given time, a scientist work, works a similar way, but some people are luckier than others in, in having um, more material to work for. There are um, moderately accurate ways of protecting eclipses like the Seros cycle and so on, which had been known to the, the Chinese and the, in the Middle East long before this period. Did that knowledge never percolate to, to Ireland? Uh, no. It's not totally accurate, but it's, it's better than what he was trying to do. Exactly, yeah. Well, the problem there really is, is Ptolemy. With, um, with Ptolemy, you'll get... Uh, and actually, before Ptolemy comes in, there, are, um, um, there is better knowledge about the lunar nodes, uh, about them having a movement in itself and so on. Um, so that comes... It's, it basically comes in with that knowledge, and that knowledge comes through Arabic channels. Um, so beforehand, um, yeah... 
they, they work from, from uh, what they had. But again, the interesting aspect there, uh, Philip Nothaft now in Oxford is doing amazing uh, things on that. Once it hits them, the idea of what they do beforehand is um, that, they knew, uh, that they know that um, they have to look for um, the moon's phase crossing the ecliptic. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got these two lunar nodes and they calculate a system of when can that happen and when do you then have an eclipse, not knowing that these lunar nodes have a movement in itself. Once that knowledge comes in, they immediately refine the theory and this is happening in the 11th, 12th century. But you need to have that knowledge from somewhere. And they, what they couldn't do, and that is the, the biggest problem of the time, they had no good instruments to observe. Mm -hmm. So once they, if they had great instruments to observe it, they could come up with those theories themselves, they need a text because they didn't have the instruments for observation. And the visible climate too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I always had thought that Irish calculations were off for the solar eclipse uh, during Whitby by two days and now you say four days. Uh, that's, a, that's a good point. It's, um, that's Beat, and Beat is following a different, Beat tells you that there is, a, well he doesn't tell you, uh, that's an interesting aspect. Um, <laughs> It's uh, beat follows the Roman reckoning of the time uh, at the time, not the Irish one. The Irish, um, um, the Irish would have seen at the time that the eclipse is um, four days in that year, four days too late, rather than what they calculated. In beat's reckoning, it's 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 a bad year to hit beat calculation, Roman calculation, because for simple mathematical reasons. That, that is not because it's inaccurate, but that is because you work with integers. If you don't work with the exact fractions, then you will have um, a margin of error of one or two days. That actually happens at the time. Beat does not tell you. He changes from what is visible in his text to what is calculable. So he knew better but he wants his tables to be right rather than what you observe. So he changes back. But though that's the difference between the two um, tables at the time. The Irish, uh, what Bede used was not the Irish table at the time. This, this issue was politically so important uh, that the, the difference between uh, what was in the books and what, what you really saw in the sky uh, must have been discussed. Yeah, yeah. This, uh, this is why I find it so strange that you have not anything written about it in these texts. These textbooks are not short, right? They are um, 80 pages would be an average. So there's a lot of scope to mention. And they discuss the basics of an eclipse. They, they, they mention that there are these things like eclipses, but they don't go further. And uh, it, I just presume that it's, it's potentially... Why are people silent about something? Either it's um, uh, of no importance, or it's too hot a topic. Maybe that's the case. Leo? Yeah. Uh, thanks very much. This was absolutely wonderful. I watched a, an overblown program last night about the Mona Lisa. This was way better. <laughs> <laughs> but Mona Lisa is much better looking. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I don't know enough about Aquitaine in the fifth century. I, I, I believe that from all, everything I presented uh, tonight, this is probably one of uh, one of the four or five key areas that we really need major research in. It would be an, an ideal, brilliant PhD topic. Uh, you can you can really make major progress there. Uh, why Aquitaine? Why the time? Um, uh, is th is there a, a metropolitan bishop involved in that? Um, what do, do the libraries look like at the time, uh, and so on? Uh, there's loads to be done. Uh, in that. I, I just don't know. Okay, right. Yeah, one last question. Yeah, then. So, in the context of so, um, spreading appreciation of science today in Ireland, how come do you think the, the notion of the, the dark ages is so persistent in our society? Well, only a few weeks ago, we had Mary Lackalys uh, talking about the dark ages in Mount Columba. Um, it seems that such language doesn't exist, say, in French. I don't know German, so do they talk about the Dark Ages universally throughout Europe still today? How are we going to banish it? It's, it's all over the place. I mean, you see, uh, you, you just need to read any textbook on the history of science, especially astronomy. 
There's this famous example, I forgot the author, writing his textbook in uh, 1931. Um, he has a chapter on um, astronomy in, in the Latin West, 500 to 1200. Then he starts, this is what happened there. Three blank pages, next chapter. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, it's basically, I mean, the, it is basic. That, that is the problem for the scientists. The science there is extremely basic. What I, I just want to, and I don't question that. Um, there's a, a, a major leap uh, within the scientific endeavor coming in through uh, um, Ptolemy. There's, there's no doubt about that. And, and more knowledge about lunar nodes and the rest of it. Um, and then this is where for the scientists real science starts. So they would not um, necessarily think about that. I still think that we, what, what is then unfortunately always done is that the scientists, there were no real scientists at the time. And that is wrong. They just didn't have the same chances. Um, but the language won't change, uh, unfortunately. We'll, we'll, we'll continue uh, to have them because it's just, I mean, I, do the, I, um, I have to do similar things. I, don't, I would never call it the Dark Ages, obviously. But it, whenever you, even if you teach, I mean, even what I presented tonight is over, oversimplification, obviously. So the more, more you oversimplify, um, the more you have this terminology that gets then ingrained. But uh, it is from a scientific from a scientist's point of view, and I can totally understand that, this is too basic to really deal with it. But there are these texts, and uh, I haven't spoken about the manuscripts yet. There are quite a number of, of texts, but we still have roughly 6,000 manuscripts between 500 and 1,200 dealing with this sort of science. So it's not something that is natural. Um, people were interested in that, clearly, and we still need to analyze them. Okay, I think we'll have to uh, yes, call a halt now. And so, to, to thank you again for uh, a very good. <laughs>